Um, I'm here today. Uh, I am, my name is Joanne Malone. I am the owner of Seeking Recovery. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. I am a 31 year recovering heroin addict. Um, I was in the United States Navy, served, so I am a vet. Thank you. Disabled. I have been doing this job for a long time. I have a bachelor's in mental health and addiction studies. I have a master's in human services and addiction, mental health and nonprofit. I was a CASA guardian at Leiden on the East Coast for eight years. Um, I was a assistant teacher at the University of Maine at Augusta, and I taught addiction classes, mental health classes as well. Uh, I came across here from the East Coast after my, my children uh, grew up, and I landed here in Great Falls, and I became a, a counselor at Gateway, and this was in August of 2017. And I started seeing, I uh, was very disappointed in the treatment that was being given here in regards to addiction and mental health. Because I myself am an addict, and I was uh, put through multiple treatments by my parents, and um, to, nothing helped. I was homeless on the streets of New York. And um, so I have been through that personally as well. I started, I understood what, how I finally got sober was that I had a phenomenal counselor who taught me that we have to deal with the underlying issue of addiction, which is normally trauma. Addiction, drug use, is a symptom of a larger problem. It is not, it becomes the problem eventually, but it is not the problem in the beginning. It's trauma, abuse, and neglect. People don't know how to cope. So they turn to drugs and alcohol, and that's what's worked for them. So they continue to use, never resolving that underlying trauma. What I found as a counselor was that it's a great business model to just surfacely treat an addict. You treat just the addiction, but you don't treat why they're using. So within six months, they come back around again. And it's a never-ending, revolving door. I didn't like it. I felt uh, ethically, as a counselor, I could not. I could not do that. But when you're the only ethical counselor in an agency that doesn't want to hear what you have to say, you eventually have to move on because you can't make a dent. You can only make a dent in your clients, and that's it. And that's what I did. I eventually left and went over to Benefis, which I had found at the time. Um, they're, they're not really equipped for addiction medicine. The um, education is extremely poor. But I ended up accepting a position at the Mac Clinic under Dr. Deborah Rose as her LAC under a grant that I was only able to treat patients that have opioid addictions. But if you've lived in Great Falls long enough, you know that the majority of the uh, drugs are alcohol and meth based. So I was having to consistently turn away people that were looking for counseling because I was not allowed to see them unless they had a opioid disorder because it was working under a grant. So at that time, uh, I decided that while I was working in the day at the hospital, I was going to open up a private practice. So I went ahead and opened up a private practice, and I worked from Benefis. I worked at Benefis from 8 in the morning until 4.30, and then I'd run over to my private practice five days a week and half a day on a Saturday, and I would see clients from 5 o'clock in the evening until 8 o'clock, until I built my practice up. While I was building my practice up, I had called the state to ask what I needed to do in order to open up a facility because I felt that the treatment here in Great Falls was not appropriate. So I jumped through all the coat of arms. It took me two months to answer them. Uh, January 6th of last year, I got my state approval as a state approved facility. Uh, they came in, Heather, uh, Heather Taylor came in, did my um, inspection, and I was licensed. I just got re-licensed. We passed our um, state audit with flying colors. Um, Jasmine Taylor, who did my audit this year, said she had never seen such wonderful documentation, was very pleased, I was pleased, as this was my first attempt of opening a facility. I started out down on the corner of 5th Street North and Central. You'll see the old Seeking Recovery signs. Just curious, are they related? Mm -hmm. hey, yes. Heather and... Uh, Heather and Ta Taylor, no, no, they're not related. Uh, and Heather has now retired as state auditor, yes. Yeah. 
Um, so March 1st of last year, my husband and I, we opened up Seeking Recovery. Three weeks later, COVID hit. Mm -hmm. I was the only facility in Great Falls that never closed their doors. I saw every client face to face. I made them come in for UAs. I gave them their counseling. Sometimes we were the only people they saw all week. Their mental health was deteriorating. We were trying the best we could. A month or two later, I brought on Maureen, who testified here, who's an LCPC. And a month or two later, I brought on Trudy as an LAC. And the three of us, with my husband, managed to keep this place going through the entire COVID. As we kept getting more and more and more clients. When we were allowed to, and the, the, um, the restrictions allowed us to, we resumed groups. And we would be doing groups four times a week, two hours in the day. We had two separate groups to accommodate people who were maybe working in the evening or couldn't go, go in the evening, they would come in the morning. And that worked well, so well that again, I had to hire on Carolyn and a receptionist because my husband could no longer answer the phones and do all this stuff. And I needed to push him into Slacker. another position. <laughs> Slacker, yeah. So that within less than a year, I went from one counselor and my husband, to now we have me and Trudy and Carolyn and Maureen. We have three LACs, one LCPC. We brought on Heather Harpering, who is a case manager who sits on the board of Voices of Hope. Um, she had, was uh, she ran the Youth Transitional Center with D, when it was open at DS, DOC. So she's been a case manager and, and has been dealing with helping clients connect to resources for years, ever since 1996, around that time. I'm here because I believe in what I'm doing. However, in the process of some of this stuff, I have been professionally threatened by a DHS supervisor. I have an email here. I will give all of this to you. Um, I reached out to Sarita asking for help and, tell, and and I was told in my email by Cammie Stone that if she doesn't like providers, she instructs her caseworkers to send clients elsewhere. And I explained to her that she did not have to like me, this was not a personality, but I and my team are the best counselors in this town. I have the best team. When I reached out to Cammie, I didn't, she, she didn't even respond. And I have never responded. I have an exhibit here that shows since September 14th, 2015, there has been consistent stuff still going on. I highlighted stuff that I'm going through as a provider right now. As a well. Do you have additional copies of that stuff? I can get that for you, yes. I again reached out to Sarita because what we have found is that caseworkers work very, very hard to break the trust between the client and the counselors. Because if they do that, client has no place to go and talk. It's easy. Conquer and divide. So I have had to save every email, text message, you name it, because I've had clients come into my office screaming and crying, telling me that DHS called them and said, I am against them, I am helping them terminate their children, and I have had to show my clients absolutely not, that's not what has been said, here is what's been said. I've had to do that. I sent an email to Sarita Jones, again, requesting help for this. She wanted to set up a meeting. That never happened. So you're saying CPS is actively sabotaging your effort? Yes, sir. To, to, to I, have, and I have a piece of paper here. My case manager is a former CPS worker. She's been bullied and harassed. She left Ari Family Services because of what was going on over there. Tyson Wilkie called me, which is against the law, trying to uh, badmouth my case manager and discourage me from hiring her. Another worker left there, went over to Voices of Hope, and he called the 
of Jackie Gittins, who was the executive director, and tr again, bad mouthed her and tried to discourage her from hiring me as employee. I have a text message here from Daria Mari when Heather Harpin was on her unit, sending it to all of her caseworkers. We are experiencing serious issues with seeking recovery providers. Please send me a list of clients who are currently enrolled with this provider and are trying to switch to them. Keep your communications to a minimum and always an email at CC me. Daria Mari is actively, she actively took a cognitively delayed client that we had in our care for three months. Very well knowing they were in our care for three months because I, I um, have my counselors send me weekly updates on every probation and CPS client and I copy paste and forward all weekly reports. So DH knew, DHS knew they were in our care. They, what happened was they took, removed the child from the mother. They called the father who was living in California. He dropped his life. He came out here. Cognitive, he is cognitively impaired a little bit. Um, his daughter went to school and told the, the teacher that, he, that my daddy spanked me. They came in, they removed the children. We got an affidavit saying that he was driving a car and while he was driving a car, he turned around and hit his child. My client does not own a driver's license and never has, and he does not own a car, and he has taken to public transportation since he has gotten here. They removed his children, made him the offending parent, he lost his Medicaid, made $50 too much, and then DHS said, well, since we're paying the bill, you go where we tell you to. They yanked him out of my facility after three months. He's been making amazing progress. He has to be completely structured because of his cognitive issues, so we have to make sure he's, and they took him and they sent him to another um, agency, and then Daria Mari told me she wasn't paying my bill. So, here's it. For services not paid, even though DHS knew this client was coming, has destabilized him. And he doesn't know these counselors, he doesn't trust them. He's built a relationship with Maureen and Carolyn. He comes to our groups, they, all, they will allow him to come here for CD. Don't go to Pensy Council. But they reached out and said, you didn't ask us permission, now that we're paying the bill, nope, he's going there. And there's nothing you can do about it. This has been happening. Um, I've had numerous clients taken from me. I have repeatedly asked to be invited to the family system team meeting, and that is the that is the committee that helps the you know the families. I'm constantly being thrown off, not introduced. Kelly Bukach, who is, directs that, directs clients to go to providers right on the meeting. Okay, she'll say, you're gonna go here, you're gonna go here, you're gonna go here, and we're like, wait a minute, there's there's like four LAC providers on the screen, there's three mental health providers on the screen, there's people showing up, us providers that would show up weekly, every week, and they're sending them to providers that don't even show up because they tell them what they want. That's what's happening. They consistently are telling our clients, don't bother UAing at seeking recovery because we will not acknowledge their UAs. They only acknowledge my clients who ways when they're dirty than they want. Um, Daria Mari has consistently, consistently told us, we are not talking about this patch. She went head to head with a medical doctor thinking that, you know, comparing cells to cells. Um, I spent eight years and $120,000 to go to school. We are the professionals. They are not allowing us to do our job. We have a, we had a client who, uh, by accident, they were they were accusing her of starting her children. She was Trudy's client. Trudy is a former medical doctor, and it was disclosed that she had Marie Chartoff tooth disease, which is a genetic disorder that 
makes you look like you're starving your child, but it's just she, she looks like she's starving. They were accusing this woman of starving her child. So when we said, you know, the mother disclosed this genetic disease, let's get tested, we were told by Cammy Stone, we have no business telling them what to do. We are to mind our own business. And yes, those children, they're, uh, this is the same client who had a newborn baby. She was couch surfing, so she was pumping her milk and putting it in the freezer. Tammy Dunlop was her caseworker. Tammy Stone was the supervisor. Tammy would go once a week to pick up the frozen breast milk. Well, this where she was couch surfing, her patches were ringing up. People were doing that, so she had to get out of there. We had to put her someplace. And Tammy said to her, I'm not coming every day to pick up your breast milk. So she told the foster mother to put the baby on formula, and that mother lost her right to breastfeed her child. Um, I have a client who was being stalked by her public defender. She was unstable at the time because she was not, not long into treatment. We were working with her mental health, uh, substance abuse. She was uh, under Dari Moore's unit as well as other caseworker. And my client kept telling me that she thinks her public defender likes her. And as we did more digging, she started showing us text message and this public defender was stalking her. We had to, she was so in such distress because CPS kept saying that her mental health was unstable, but it was unstable because this person was stalking her. She cut her throat with a piece of glass um, it ended up where this public defender was arrested. He was brought to trial three weeks ago, and he lost his license. Um, and this case is still open, and this woman doesn't have a trial back. And she's been clean for a year. These are all the emails. Email chains. Some of these clients. Um, not only do we, not only do we help, you know, a lot of the caseworkers, there are a lot of caseworkers in that department that are really good. They work the cases legitimately. They don't do anything underhanded. We all work with them. We close their case. The reunification goes, every, or termination, whichever one. And we, they move on. We don't, there's only a few that are doing underhanded stuff. I had a client that was ringing up so high for heroin and fentanyl, yet Cammie Dunlop, Cammie Stone allowed this woman to visit her baby. And I attached to the UA result, begging them, please don't let her, because it's a contact drug. If she touches this baby, and nothing was done. CPS continually canceling clients, uh, canceling appointments. When a person comes into treatment, their very, their very focus is their addiction because their life has become out of control. As time goes on, things kind of calm down but they still need to learn daily living skills. They still maybe don't know how to cope with things. This is a process. This is why our treatment program takes a year to go through, because it's a process. We always have to make sure we look for stressors, making sure that, because if you have that foundation, that's cracked. Everything else doesn't matter from that point. We are constantly being interfered with, constantly. And then when we say, stop, they said, well, you didn't refer to us anyway, so he's not sure. Yes. If we make any waves, they try to pull the client. We have clients that come to us crying because their public defender won't defend them. 
because their public defender just tells them, you need to just do what you're told. We have clients that are telling us CPS is, is trying to force divorce so that the other parent can get their child back. They're promoting divorce. They're promoting that. When I sent an email asking about this particular client that was cognitively impaired, asking how you feel that doing this to him is in the best interest of him, and I sent that email all the way up to the top, I never even got a response. Not even from the caseworker, from the supervisor. I got nothing. We have clients being bullied and harassed by their public defenders. Um, we have continued, even though DHS refuses to pay this one particular client's uh, case management, the, the cognitive, he needs structure and he needs case management so bad that I'm eating that bill so that we can make sure he is successful in reunification because if we pull out case management, he's, there's nobody to help him. So they're not paying, they don't want to pay the bill, but we're still providing those case management services. And they took this poor guy out of our facility and sent him down the street and said, uh, they can do what they want because they're paying the bill. His latest appointment with me, he thought was on the same day. He had his appointments all arranged so that he could remember to come. And Heather, our case manager, had worked with that. So he came in this past week just in a panic because he had uh, this new person he's supposed to see. And his scheduling, he said at the same time to see me. So I said, okay. So you go down and see them, do what they what they're telling you to do. He said, let me know what you know, let me know what's going on. So he went down. They said, oh no, your appointment's not until tomorrow. So he came back to me in a total panic. Like he said it was tomorrow. He says, and I, I'm, I'm I said, okay, dude, just breathe, it's okay. So I have made him an appointment to come back and see me at the same time. I said, if it's if it's the same time as them, then you let me know and we'll get you a different time. But they've interfered with him already. He's beginning to panic. But he's been doing exceptionally well. We have we have parents who are, are sober and haven't seen their kids in six months. And we have parents that are using daily and they're getting visits weekly. And when I asked Sarita to look into these specific cases, I sent an email and nothing was done. And so What I'm asking is um, a lot of these people are scared. A lot of these people, we have over 25 open DHS cases in our facility. And, um, and my facility has been targeted um, by certain CPS supervisors with instructions not to send clients to me, irregardless of the services we provide. We have a client who, has, who was told two days ago, well, they're in Kalispell and their child is still here because they can't get the case moved. So they come down once a week. Regina Turner specifically told her you are not allowed to seek services at Seeking Recovery. And you are not allowed to seek mental health services in the town of Great Falls. You have to do it in Kalispell. So I am, clients are being blocked from my services. <coughs> because we're advocating. So, I know um, as a business owner, I probably will get some repercussions. However, I believe in what I'm doing. What I'm asking of you guys is to please be aware. So if we, have, if we do have to reach out to report any retaliations that you are willing to hear them because it's happening. We want to make change. Um, 
we, we work very well at probation parole. We work very well with lawyers, private lawyers in this town. Some doctors send to us. All of my um, LACs, all of my counselors have masters. They're, they are very well educated. They've been doing this for a long period of time. As of July 2020, there are over, there are only 791 licensed addictions counselors in the state of Montana, and there are 79,000 reported Montanans that have drug use. That's just the reported ones. So we're working equally as hard, but like a professional, they have to listen to our pain. We have an input. Where they send the clients to us for treatment and then tell us to shut up and mind our business when we try to to give the input. No, they're not using or whatever. They don't, it doesn't matter. So there is a lot of heartache going on. Um, we get calls every day in the middle of the night, parents crying, want to see their kids. Um, I continue to plan on expanding uh, the facility. We are in search of people now for, uh, for counselors. We are working with the tribes trying to put together a Native American IOP program so that Native Americans can get the proper um, addiction treatment that they, that they need. There are some Native American, Latino, and LGBTQ clients that are being extra harassed. Um, and so here uh, we do really, just do really great work here. I'm very sad that this has to be like this, but um, our clients, we, we, we have a culture in our facility where we do this because we love what we do. And we do this because we were in those shoes. I was an addict, you know, active addict. We, we, have, we, we have recovering alcoholics as counselors. We know what we're doing. It took me seven months to get reciprocity from the state of Maine to come into Montana. Because the state of Montana said we don't want just anybody coming in here practicing on our residents. And some of the worst atrocities, atrocities are being done by practitioners in this town to their own residents. So this is why everybody has um, come together. We are seeing a web of people. You, if you watch closely, you can see how it's all tied. One person's tied into the other person's, tied into that service, is tied into this. But it's a, you can watch as you watch and see that web come about. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that as a counselor, my counselors, they represent my facility, whether they're in my facility or not in my facility. So I don't expect any of my counselors to be out of bar drinking. It doesn't look good. They're supposed to be recovered. However, I got a call from the Department of Criminal Investigation because there was sexual impropriety and illegal drug use going on between the Office of Public Defenders and Child Protective Services. Text messages, everything was turned over into evidence. We don't have anybody advocating for these families. They say they're defense attorneys, they're not. We have supervisors married to county attorneys. They're on the same case. They are, the deck is stacked against them right from the beginning. We have emails up at the attorney general's office because they are so horrendous and so disgustingly unprofessional and heartbreaking that public defenders are sending to these families, telling them, if you don't leave your wife, you're not gonna get your kids back. 
this is your fault. You need to do what you're supposed to do. There's no conditions of return being given to us. We're asking for constant collateral. We're never given it. I have to, I have to get hostile sometimes because if we don't have the collateral, we don't know what's going on with the client. We don't know. We're not going to take CPS's word for anything. We have <sighs> clients who are almost done with their treatment plans, and then they go to court, and next thing you know, they got another four months because they added something onto the treatment plans. We have clients who, when they go to the Cameron Center, and it's a safe place, and the mom is there, I had a client, mom's there, both children, they finally reunited. She was forced to stick her children in daycare five days a week, eight hours a day, even though she was sitting in the Cameron Center waiting for them to come home. Because that's what she was told to do. No bonding, no reunification, consistent separation, even when they're in the Cameron Center. And even when they're being, I mean, I work with Therese Martinez, who's the director, and she's got unbelievable programs. We UA all everybody for her. We work in, in conjunction with her. Um, we're, we're sitting around waiting to go into court or waiting to go to a family engagement meeting and the CPS worker doesn't send us the link so the judge can't hear the providers talking and telling what a good job they're doing because they won't let us in. They have side talks ex parte. Mm -hmm. So that by the time we get on, and by the time the client gets on, it's already decided. It's already decided. I watched, um, I personally watched CPS caseworker and two, uh, two supervisors walk out of Judge Reynolds' chambers down in Yelena right before Judge Reynolds took the, chain, took the bench and they threw everybody who was in support of that mother out of the room including a, a former representative a, and let it was a, at least 15 people against her and she was so intimidated and the reason for removal in that case was unwillingness, unwillingness to cooperate with this department for a two-day-old newborn from the hospital i think i interviewed that woman didn't i i think you did yeah i did donkey or something right donkey. Mm -hmm. one of the most important people in a, in a child protection case is a CASA. And I have yet to see one on a case. These children aren't, if they have a, if they have a guardian at litem and it's a lawyer, they are required to only see them once every six months. If you are a CASA, you are required by law to see them monthly. So eyes constantly on. We have 15 cases up at the ombudsman level. And we have been told that not one ombudsman case has been answered by DHS since 2019. Not one case. So that's why there is no change, because they're asking for information. The ombudsman are asking for information. CPS is not giving it. So we can keep sending complaints all we want to. Gala Goodwin messaged me and said they are so overloaded up there, there's only two of them. Because she wanted to come down here and talk to the families, and she couldn't even leave her office. Because there's that many complaints up at the level. We're asking for help. We're asking for you guys to be aware of retaliation, which is going to come. Because these clients, some, these clients work. There are cases, yes, where we actually do have to help them terminate, and it's sad. But we have these cases where we equally help them reunify. And we're fighting so hard, and these clients are giving up hope. And what they're doing is they give them hope, and then they take it away. And then they give them hope, and they take it away. And they torture them, and they break them down. And these people are addicts. And then when they use, ha, huh, see, we told you you were. We told you. Now we're moving for termination because you can't stay clean. I am this demographic. I came from a family of abuse. I was an IV drug user. I went into the military. I turned my life around. I have a facility. Recovery is possible. 
and a living proof of that. And so were these families. And we need your help. We can't do it by ourselves. But we need your help.